it's going to eventually look and taste and all that a little bit more like that mom. Almost every plant should taste like a gyri. The mom has a specific flavor. That was the female that I used. Mr. Nerd asked me if I would talk about some breeding terms and what they actually mean to say the consumer or um, someone growing things for the first time. Typically what you'll see when you're buying seeds from somebody is you'll see, say the name of a, a cross, and I'll use Odin Sons for example, okay? That's one of my crosses. It's a, a cross between Thor's Hammer XXL F3, and that is by Viking Gardens. That was the female that I used. She was a, a big, beautiful plant. The male of that cross was Loki OG by Gnome Automatics, which was formerly Mandalorian Genetics. I had hunted for a male. I knew I wanted to use some Mandalorian Genetics, so I, I popped a bunch of seeds of his, looking specifically for the different males. I had narrowed it down to three, and this Loki OG just had everything that I, I felt at the time I wanted in a male to cross into and make my some of my first things that I ever created. And taking that that male Loki OG and crossing it into or, or pollinating the Thor's hammer, that created the F1, which is the first filial generation. So the F stands for filial. F1, that's what that means. It's basically you took a male and a female and you created something new out of that. In this case, I created Odin Sons. And that would be the first generation. The, the first F1 is the first of that generation. Now, if moving on to F2 and F3 and F4 and so, that is where you would see something that would be called an IBL or an inbred line. So the F2 is you're taking sibling plants and you're crossing them to each other. An F1 female times an F1 male, in this particular example, you're crossing them together. Now you've created the F2. Now the biggest difference between the F1 and the F2 is going to be your phenotypes that you're gonna see. People will say, well, what is a phenotype? Okay. When you grow out an F1 generation, you'll typically see between five and seven different types of plants that could show up in there. What do I mean by different plants? Okay, so you could have some that lean more towards what the mom was, some that lean more towards what the dad was. And then you'll have different combinations of the two. So you might have the structure more like the dad, but the flavor of the mom. You might have a nice combination of the two. So if you have something that was blueberries and you had something that was grape, for example, my blueberry grape, you then have a combination of those two flavors where individually you only had either blueberry or you had grape. Moving to the F2, now you've opened up the gene pool a lot more. So now instead of having that five to seven different phenotypes, you now could have upwards to 20 plus different phenotypes, which as a breeder, it's exciting because at that F2, you can find a lot of different possibilities. You're gonna have grandparents, potentially great grandparents of the original cross you made now showing up in different ways and different combinations. You may find something really, truly special. I found in my funeral desserts in the F2, I found that pink pheno, the one that I released back in December. I only released a few packs of it because it's not showing up in every single plant that comes out. It's not showing up in all of them. It's about one in 10. I don't believe anyone that's grown them out has found one yet, but in my experience and the ones that I've grown out, it's about one in 10 that show up and it shows up fairly late, but I am working on that more to bring it forward to specifically isolate that trait, which is, it can be difficult, especially with autoflowers. You can't just find a specific plant and then continue on with it. Going to F3, now you're looking for two plants that are very similar structure-wise, flavors, all that kind of stuff. So you can combine those two sibling plants to now bring it to the F3, which locks it back in a little bit more. So now you'll have less phenotypes. And what the goal is as a breeder moves along into the F4, F5, F6 is to really isolate. So now you're not getting as many phenotypes. You might see two or three in the later generations rather than the amount you typically do early on. That's a basic rundown of an F, F1, what F1 is, F2, F3, F, you know, those kind of the filial generations, which I'm talking male to female breeding. So now moving on, you, you will see something that will say S1. So an S1 is similar with the exception of now you're dealing with feminized 
seeds. So all of the seeds should be female. In S1, it's called a cell thing. So how that works with photoperiods is you'll take a plant, you'll grow it out, then you'll take two clones off that plant. This is how I do it. You grow those clones out, you then start the reversal process. You're basically taking that female plant and you are introducing either STS, which is silver thiosulfate, or CS, which is colloidal silver. There are a few other ways to do it, but these are the two typical ways that I will do it to just one of those plants. And what it does is it creates female pollen sacs. So the pollen that will come out of those will be XX pollen. Therefore, when you take that pollen and you apply it to another female plant, the seeds will then be female because there's only XX in the generations. If you get seeds like that and all of a sudden they're herming, or they become intersex, which is a better, better way of looking at it. Something went wrong. Either that original female was prone to going intersex, so it wasn't tested properly. Because you can still stress a plant out even if it's just female and it could create pollen sacs. But that is, that's kind of talk for another, another time, you know, as far as those kind of things. We're just doing kind of the basics of what the, the F1, now this is the S1, so that would be a selfing. You're now taking, you have the two clones of the same plant, you've reversed one, it's now creating pollen. You then pollinate the other one. That's going to create your first generation of feminized seeds. You can also do this by reversing a female plant and pollinating another female plant of another completely different plant which creates the F1 of that feminized cross. And then you can see the same thing, S2, S3, S, you know, so on and so forth. Now, when it comes to autoflowers, you can self an autoflower. Basically, you're, what you typically will do is you'll isolate one or two branches to reverse. When those f have fully created pollen sacs, you then can pollinate that plant itself that would be technically a selfing of the plant because autoflowers you can clone them but the amount of time it takes to clone and do all that you really you would really have to have your timing down near perfect in order to truly self it like you can a photo period plus with a photo period you're able to, to grow out the genetics you know what you have you basically are able to kind of get an idea of what you're going to see in future generations from growing it out or what you'd like to see with autoflowers as you're growing the plant out if you've grown it out enough in the first generation of that plant or whatever the the initial parent is you kind of have an idea of what you're going to get so you can kind of guesstimate and hope and in the end you know it doesn't you don't know what you're going to get until you grow out the, the um, first generation and you, you're growing it out for yourself which is what a breeder should do. You know, you create the genetics, you should be growing those genetics out yourself, finding what you're seeing. And then like I have a test team that I will, after that point is, is gone, I will send it to them to see if they are getting the same results as I am. It's just the way I do it. Other breeders do it differently. What typically people will do with an autoflower when they're going to feminize it is they're actually reversing, which would be an R1. So you may see that somewhere. A lot of people still just use the S1. But if they're taking one female plant, reversing it, and then pollinating another female plant or a sister plant, so not an exact copy of it, but a sister of it, that would technically be a reversal. So you're reversing one plant and then you're pollinating a sister of that same plant. So this, they had the same parents. And then you can move on again from there. So you have the, the S1, S2, S3, you know, and so on. So in doing that, you're trying to really lock in um, the phenotypes and, and have less variation, say. Great for um, people that want to grow out and have the same results from every single plant they're growing. Breeders typically want the younger generations because they can then hunt for something unique they can use themselves. So one thing that a lot of people kind of get confused with is when it comes to back crossing. What is back crossing? So that's basically now you have a plant, you've created a new cross and maybe the phenotypes of that are not exactly what you're looking for. You want a little bit more of what the mom has. Maybe the mom has a specific flavor or bud structure 
or leaf structure or um, leaf to calyx ratio. Maybe the, the mom is more dense. So you're basically going to take the children and you're going to pollinate or, yeah, in this case, you'd be pollinating the female. Whether you do that by reversing your new cross and then pollinating the, the original mom or by basically taking the, a male of that new cross and pollinating it back into the mom to get more seeds to kind of look at. That would be a back cross and that would be known as a BX1. Sometimes people will, will do that again and again and again because they're really trying to lock in something that maybe only existed in that original mom or female plant. It could be a, a, a special color or a flavor, like I said, a, a bud density or maybe yield. Maybe that original mom just had just phenomenal yield and you're not seeing that to the extent in the children. So you're gonna keep back crossing. Now, every time you do that, you are bringing in more of that original mom's genetics into the pool. So it's going to eventually look and taste and all that a little bit more like that mom, the more back crossing you do. But sometimes that's, that's the only thing you can do. You know, maybe it's potency that that original mom had. Sometimes that, that, that one back cross is enough to bring more potency into your, into your mix without making it too much like that original mom. Because in my eyes, if that original mom was so great that you're looking to continue to back cross and back cross and back cross to get more of that mom's, you know, components or whatever into it, unless the offspring of that back cross is becoming better and better and better as you go, I don't see the point. Just go ahead and, you know, re-release that original mom make more of that original mom to to put out there if it's that good but back crossing can actually be very beneficial in the overall scheme of things as far as you know locking in specific traits that you really want i have not done a lot of back crossing myself because i, I prefer to, to take two parents that i i know they work really well together and they create something that is better better than either or so that's that's pretty much it you know it, i i can dive a lot deeper into specifics of those kind of things. I touched on a lot of different things. We touched on the F1, the S1, the R1, the back cross, uh, moving forward in generations as far as you know what those are. So now you should have a somewhat of a, an idea when you're looking on a pack of seeds and it says F3. Well, now you should know that that means you know there was an original cross of two parents. They then crossed the first generation of those to create the F2. They then hunted through those and picked two phenotypes that were very similar to each other, usually. And then they cross those together to make the F3, which is now a little bit more stabilized. You should get less phenotypes and then so on and so forth as, as you move forward. I hope that explains some of those kind of things. So when you are going forward and buying seeds, you understand that, okay, this is an F5 or this is an F6. Therefore, if they say, hey, this should taste like a dirty sock. Well, when you finish it, it should taste like a dirty sock. Almost every plant should taste like a dirty sock. Now, I don't know, some people like dirty socks. I'm not a fan, so most of my stuff will never taste like a dirty sock. Uh, but who knows, maybe I'll acquire a taste for it. 